<clears throat> Aloha mai kako. Good evening. Um, my name is Tyler Can. I am the Senior Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at HOMA. And it's um, a really great pleasure to be here um, speaking to you this evening. I'm actually standing here instead of our director, Halona Norton Westbrook, who is in New York City. Her, um, her brother and his husband got married last night, so she um, had other business. <laughs> uh, but yes, we wish them all happiness. Um, and of course, we are really grateful for this um, exhibition, Salman Tour, No Ordinary Love. Um, it's an extraordinary exhibition uh, and is organized by the Baltimore Museum of Art and curated by its uh, Dorothy Wallace Wagner director, Asma Naim. Um, we are looking forward to welcoming Asma here in mid-September, September 15th. So uh, mark your calendars for, for that, stay tuned. Um, um, as w I have a, lots of people to thank, but I'm going to really make a, a really strong thanks and expression of gratitude um, to Shangri-La Museum of Islamic Art, Culture and Design and the Doris Duke Foundation. They um, have really been extraordinarily generous with this exhibition. Um, I feel like shows like this, uh, well, let me say also, Luring Augustine Gallery um, is really helped smooth the way on this exhibition and been a really important interlocutor um, and friend in this uh, shows and has really made, I think, Salman's um, experience here in Hawaii uh, special as well. So thank you for that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think what I was going to say is sort of like museum, uh, museums are really nothing without their community um, and exhibitions like this are a real opportunity to, um, to be in community with and to stand in solidarity with um, our Mahu and LGBTQ plus communities here. Um, and I think that is really important, especially in this political moment. Um, and we want to really recognize the particularity of queer experience, but I, I do believe, you know, the sensitivity, the intimacy, and the humanity of Salman Tour's works are really something that everyone can experience, feel, appreciate. Um, so I'll just say um, a couple of words and then it'll be me and uh, Salman in conversation and just the, the, the may, very nearest biographical information that Salman Tour uh, was born in Lahore, Pakistan and lives in New York and works in New York City. Um, you know, I think has really come to, in recent years, and we can talk about this, like a certain amount of acclaim <laughs> um, and has really become a, a, a significant figure of, in painting of this, his generation. Um, I don't mean to embarrass you by saying that, but it's true. <laughs> um, so, you know, it is, we are all the more grateful that uh, Salman has come here to be in, uh, at, you know, here at this opening and for this conversation. And uh, thank you all once again for being here as well. So without really further ado, let's take a seat. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Um, really, uh, once thank again. Thank you for having me. Yeah. How's it? How has it been? Well, I I have never been to Hawaii before, um, and I didn't dream that my art would bring me here. And so that's very special. It's very surreal. Um, it's um, the furthest west I've ever been. It's a very particular sociology in kind of um, language like American states. Um, so it's, 
I think I'm just absorbing it. Uh, I've just been here for about three days. And I'm going to leave tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'll give you some fleeting like impressions of uh, what I feel. My first kind of impression of Hawaii is um, the f uh, nature of the flora, which is uh, so similar to Pakistan, which is, which is where I'm originally from, even though New York is my home now. Um, just uh, the uh, banyan trees, uh, the frangi bani, um, plane trees, um, palms, um, and just various kind of hedges and bushes that exist around um, a kind of architecture which is also very reminiscent, uh, nostalgic almost. Um, that it has created a kind of sense of nostalgia with, for me <laughs> being here, which is odd. So, uh, And some of those things can be seen in the uh, paintings which are about uh, sort of growing up in a traditional family home in, in Pakistan in this show. So it's a little anecdotal thing. And um, yes, I noticed your, your reaction to the banyan tree. It's like, oh, a banyan tree. And, um, you know, it is things like flora that can help kind of connect us to place and to, um, you know, understand where we are in, on, the, on the globe. And that sense of, you know, uh, it being a very distant and unfamiliar place, but having elements of like familiarity there, I think is, um, but your ex this particular exhibition is also uh, traveled from Baltimore to Tampa it is uh, now here, and then it will go to the Rose Museum at Brandeis University. Um, and, you know, having this exhibition here in Honolulu, I mean, maybe it's an unfair question because you have just arrived and I don't expect you to know um, all of the sort of dynamics, you know, and the significance of um, having your exhibition in this place. Um, but maybe for you, I mean, how has it been having the exhibition to travel different places and how has it changed or grown? Well, I'll say I'm interested in talking about just how, how it feels here. And I would say that some of the things in my imagination that, kind of were in, that made me feel familiar with this, um, the history, some of the history of Hawaii was um, just a similar similarity to um, United India, to Northern India, to Pakistan, with its kind of colonial and imperialist uh, sort of past. Um, its uh, encounter with um, Europeans and um, and um, the sort of very complicated um, results of that encounter. Mm. Um, so I felt that in that way, like some of the stories of being in between cultures, uh, trying to find ways to maybe translate culture, um, may maybe visually or uh, creating a new little culture of your own um, that transcends the problems of uh, the contradictions of uh, the clash or that encounter of, of different um, cultures. Um, that is in some of the work and I felt, well, you know, I hope that it, <laughs> it's in some of the work and I <laughs> felt that that kind of had a common sort of ground with um, some of the uh, kind of cultural processes that I know are happening here or have happened here for a while. It's wonderful to hear you articulate so eloquently the very same reasons that I think we felt your exhibition was yeah. going to um, resonate with people here. Um, and yeah, I hope as you know, as uh, we have just opened the show, but I hope that throughout the exhibition is, you know, this 
people really see that or feel that. Um, you know. In terms of, um, and I see we have um, this uh, image on the screen here. Right. Um, so there, and there are a few paintings like this um, that show figures looking at themselves in a mirror. Yeah. Um, so there's like the weightlifter. This one, that one was yeah. called Mommy, um, Boy yeah. with Neck Chain. Like, yeah. Um, and I love, um, I sort of put all of these on a wall together, most of them on a wall together. Um, I feel there is an, a sort of element of a narrative almost that's constructed in those, in those images of sort of encountering, encountering oneself. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, it raises all of these, but also the self and an image. And it raises all of these, like, the three main themes of the show, sort of desire, family, tradition. And I think there's a lot that's wrapped up in those particular images. But maybe you can talk about the... There are a bunch of, of like, mirrors and, like, reflections or, like, this through phones. Boy with neck chain there. Right. Um, in that, like, sometimes, like, the person is looking in the mirror or they're looking into the phone. And I'm feel like I'm I'm interested in kind of self presentation, uh, a kind of um they're kind of pictures about self love <laughs> uh got without any shame or being busy in the middle of self of yeah, kind of regard self regard. Um self regard but not narcissism, I suppose. Yeah, not narcissism necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um and um it's I guess, like, also a way of um, painting technology. Like, I, I have tried on occasion to kind of seamlessly put kind of wires and laptops and like phones into the and the, into the painting and make them seamless to me in that language because um, I feel like they have to get a passport to like enter <laughs> that <laughs> territory of like very traditional language of painting mm -hmm. or um you know all the way from like the kind of like i guess like in european history like renaissance all the way down to like impressionism even it's just i um, there is a danger of it kind of becoming like a pastiche mm -hmm. cliche and i feel like painting is a language that already has so many cliches that it's a minefield um of avoiding or kind of also just maybe like levels that have to be just right <laughs> for me that's how i think about it um and those yeah. i mean i suppose you know 50 100 years a 100 years hence people yeah. will be sort of um you know, seeing these artifacts of a certain technology mm -hmm. and a certain, you know, in relation to like what the internet or social media is right now and what maybe what kind of mirror that holds up to, you know, ourselves. Um, yeah, but I, but you've also spoken, I think, about the sort of particular illumination oh, of yes. the screen. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really kind of fun Christian kind of light <laughs> that comes, <laughs> comes out of like a phone. Um, uh, so, um, you know, and it's uh, for me, it's like a way to paint that kind of uh, the drama of light um, in which someone may be very busy kind of looking at themselves or looking at like a dating app or like or looking at something on a an advertisement or whatever on a phone. And uh, it's a, it's a, for me, it's a very good way to kind of get into the concentration and boredom of someone who's very busy. Um, and usually I'd like to create stories or portraits in which people are busy. They're not really they're interested maybe in their, their inward. They're not really interested in the viewer as much. Um, yeah, that's, um, I mean, it is perhaps the only one I can think of that really addresses you the viewer is that a mommy image right um, where she is painting her eyebrow but right. that, that one eye that is open <laughs> is looking straight at you right but what's wonderful is there's those two other reflections right. of a young man yeah. um, um i presume in in the in the mirror in the compact right and so you are essentially standing in the position of that 
boy. Right. Um, and she's looking, encountering, sort of looking straight at you. Right. And I, I love the way a painting can really sort of presuppose a viewer in that way. And yeah. so no matter who you are standing in front of that painting, like you become that, that person that, you know, that young man in the mirror. Um, and yeah, just sort of, that can really shift, um, you know, when you inhabit that person. I mean, right. there, that is maybe why paintings create the sort of sense of empathy, paintings like that. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, they kind of make you, I guess, like stand and literally like almost in someone else's shoes and, um, you know, it's very Velasquez. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, sort of like Manet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fully Berger. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, there is in that little, um, with so many of your, the stories that are, in your paintings, you know, it's very autobiographical. It's tied to mm -hmm. your experience of growing up in Pakistan. Um, you know, maybe you could say a little bit about that and your journey to the United States. Yeah. So I think paintings are, I mean, they are semi-autobiographical, you know, and they're half kind of fictions. They're not all, <laughs> you know, completely necessarily biographical. But, I, you know, I think I am interested in, First of all, I don't use any like models or um, photographs. So um, this kind of style of painting developed um, just by painting from imagination. And in the course of that, what happened was that my hand started tracing this particular kind of face. And I would end up making a very similar face again and again. And that became a bit annoying so be, i would like think <laughs> of like someone like a friend yeah uh, like their nose or like their lips and like mix them all together to like try to like do it through memory um but generally like i i in, I, in the sort of mi made up protagonists if you will of mm. the paintings i'm interested in like cliches of um or descriptions of Middle Eastern and South Asian um, bodies, um, and you know, in a kind of anxious, like kind of maybe post 9/11 way, um, or mm. um, in a way that is like racist or uncomfortable. Um, but you know, I like to do it with maybe affection, you know, mm. um, and you know, it kind of helps me sort of um, get a protagonist who is uh, going through a similar kind of set of feelings, like they're maybe like, you know, uh, an immigrant, like they have to kind of uh, navigate different cultures uh, into like a, a, a kind of entering into a new culture. Mm. Um, and with it, there's also a, a sense of... Uh, Kind of vulnerability but i it's very important for me to be funny um i am i think i have a sense of humor when i like, <laughs> when i'm joking but like, i mean so, i think this this work is <laughs> is actually quite funny um yeah it's it's a it's a bit uh like melodramatic yeah um and camp yeah like uh and so i hope that kind of <laughs> comes through like you know like i when i was painting this like you know i threw in it wasn't really working for me, and then I kind of threw in the candle. <laughs> then, <laughs> then it really worked for me. Uh, <laughs> because it looks like his, I don't know, it's like it has like a candle stick in front of him, but like in this kind of romantic <laughs> way, or like maybe it was his birthday and like no one's there. No one, no one showed yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was I was picturing kind of a date night, yeah. and you know somebody just, it just got he ghosted stood up. or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know. uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but there are those those moments, and the you know the sort of um, marionette feel of your figures mm -hmm. or these um, these nose bulbous noses. You know, those two add a a sense of. Humor, uh, you know, a light touch yeah. to something that is, you know, often quite intimate and, you know, sensual, erotic. Yeah. yeah. Um, these private, private moments. 
Um, and, you know, for me, I, I do feel like those private moments are something that we hold so tightly to ourselves mm -hmm. often, or the person that we are with, I suppose. Um, and it takes a real something to put that out into, into the world in, as an artwork, um, something that is constructed precisely to be visible right. uh, by yourself and other people. Yeah. There's such a public that is sort of inherent mm -hmm. in the act of representation, right? Um, but yeah, what's that like for your, how, how do you feel that came? I think into in a, your practice, in a very short way, I would say that it's big. Eventually, I guess I, I got to a place maybe in I'd say maybe 2016, um, after having kind of painted academically in a very traditional way, um, to a place where I felt that I wanted to kind of react against, I, I guess like my upbringing, which was to kind of hide. Uh, any uh, expression of my desire and self-identity mm. to make room for other people. Um, and um, I mean, it wasn't in a kind of like angry, lashing out way, but I felt like I wanted to just try out every freedom that was available to every heterosexual. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, and um, so that I'm very glad that worked for me really well <laughs> but uh you know and i had have a lot of followers from you know developing countries or you know and nowadays everything is so connected mm. um i mean i just wanted to share this little i think this kind of anecdote kind of explains <laughs> the, maybe the, the cost of it which was that you know i would uh, now and then like get messages that were like dark you know, <laughs> or like threatening and um so um i ended up uh, my a friend of mine was like oh you can make a list of words on instagram that no one should use for you or hmm. to you hmm. that means that they can post a comment or send you a dm but it's only in their phone. No one else can, no one see, else it. can see it. You can't see it. No ah. one else. It doesn't exist. Actually, they think oh. they've won, but they haven't. Uh. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but so anyway, I ended up making a list of words, both in like Urdu and and, uh -huh. and Punjabi and in English, in singular, in plural, <laughs> like <laughs> the, with the correct spelling, then with the troll uh -huh. spelling, like, <laughs> and so I ended up with like hundreds of words and that would like if they were so nasty like to read to myself <laughs> just like this is like a big horde of like what i imagine might like be used to harm me in any way but you know and and that's been very good but every now and then you know there's someone who might uh, have like a nasty comment under a painting mm -hmm. or you mm -hmm. know something like oh you fag or something like that and um so, you know, every now and then I discover that I missed, like, the singular. Right. <laughs> or, like, right. the plural. You can, you can <laughs> add that word <laughs> yeah, so to your list. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, so, I mean, that word is one that you have reclaimed. In, yeah. Yeah. In so the last one I discovered was I didn't write homosexuality. Ah. Hmm. I had, like, homosexual, like, homo, like, just every, every other thing. <laughs> but anyway, so, like, it's a... <laughs> <laughs> it's a learning curve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose it's, you know, um, deeply unfortunate um, that being oneself, being queer, is, there is, it's inherently political in that sense. Um, you know, I think of sort of Aud Audre Lorde in the sort of uses of the erotic. And I mean, it's, Mm -hmm. writing specifically about sort of a female kind of sensual energy and connection that is a source of political power right um you know without again recognizing like where she's c coming from in that piece you know maybe there is also um the political force of the erotic or sensual 
in your work too. I mean, you connected it to freedom. Um, but your work itself is is not necessarily. I had a question earlier. Is this activist? <laughs> right. I I don't think of but myself as an activist. I, that's what I said um, in answering that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think of myself as an activist. I I very plainly think of myself as someone who spends like a lot of the time uh, every day alone in my studio working with my hands. And that's really like what I live for on a daily basis. But I think that it, it is very fortunate that I'm living in a time that I can, that, that, you know, that queer people should be very loud and clear because there is a little window that people are hearing. Mm. Um, and that, you know, as we can see, like that's like very vulnerable. It's, you know, there's a whole new, um, gang of people <laughs> that is out to get yeah, us now. Yeah. So, um, and there is this element of sort of violence that happens in your work. I mean, I suppose it's violence, um, in the fag puddles in particular, is sort of what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Or there's a couple works where you think like, oh, something has gone wrong here. There, this is a, a dangerous moment. Um, night capture, I think is the work that I'm thinking of. Right. I mean, those are I, a lot of the darker paintings in the show, like are based on either, um, you know, like autobiography or stories that I heard from my friends or uh, stories that just ended up, you know, kind of not having an ending, or, you know, or be a piece of news. Um, and also just based on paranoia and fear as well. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, so, you know, I think one way that where the kind of political and maybe like erotic or the visibility of the work kind of intersect is what happened um, in the last iteration of the show, which was at the Tampa Museum of Art. Um, that was kind of a surprise because uh, the show was going to open. I was very excited. It looked great. Um, I had never been to Tampa before. Um, and um, the you know the museum was pretty like embarrassed, but they would like, but they said, well, you know, our lawyers are advising us that you know maybe we shouldn't use the words queer or gay in the invite because um, we might get fined. We probably will get fined. Um, but I mean, Soak isn't that, that in. incredible? <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, they had every right to share that with me, and of course, like it, uh, the director of the museum is is queer, the mayor of the city is queer, uh, so we had, <laughs> we had plenty of people on our side, uh, and uh, you know, obviously, they paid the fine rather than do like um, like give in to something like that. But um, that made the show very charged and special mm. because um, um, it felt like everyone who was there was part understood part the significance of, of this kind of like little bastion of like resistance yeah um and um it was very warm and friendly and i felt like very i guess american <laughs> 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 because like i i did i became a citizen in 2020 or in 2019 not sure mm. and um, and since then, I, I have been asking myself off and on, like, what is, what is America and what is it? Mm. Um, and and it's, that, having attended a naturalization ceremony, yeah. um, I mean, that is, that is one moment where I really felt good about <laughs> like the idea of yeah. America, right. you know, um, and, and America in the process of living its ideals. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. Um, but um, yes. But you know, it's. Uh, I think one of the things, the questions that pops up with the American journey is that, like, to me, is to kind of think about the American idea of freedom, but also maybe the cost of choice, mm -hmm. know, because uh, it, I grew up in a culture where choice is kind of eliminated, and um, you know, it is present 
I guess, in many different ways than would be like in the way that uh, uh, Americans could perceive it. But on the whole, and like I think um, there's a kind of release from choice, and mm. that's like a kind of weird freedom. <laughs> So it's like you don't you don't have to make a choice. It's just like mm. it's the uh and but the cost of that is that you know there is no social mobility. Um and um so anyway, these are some of the things that um yeah. um come to mind. I'll ask a couple more questions and then I would love to invite questions from you all. I'm sure you have them. Um, in fact, we can even talk about the fag models a bit. Yes, yeah. please. And the works on paper. So there's, yeah. um, you know, about half the show is works on paper as as well. But tell tell us about the fag models. So there, um, I started painting these uh, kind of piles of things that are uh, objects, um, mostly uh, or severed sort of looking limbs, but they look like they're made of like kind of plasticine. So it's not really a psychopathic kind of <laughs> <laughs> violence, but they're, they're more like, I guess, like uh, limbs that can be like picked up and reassembled in different um, permutations. Um, and then just various like knickknacks that I'm thinking about or that might be fun to paint for me. Um, I, and, you know, that kind of began with like painting, you know, belts or like boots or heels, a, a boa, feather, you know, kind of different textures. Um, but um, really, it's uh, for me, it's become a kind of um, um, a heap of like fabulous sort of frustration uh, with the failure of like translation. And um, um, often these, these fag bottles, as I eventually started calling them, are kind of leaky <laughs> <laughs> and this look like something you know i'm thinking of like ideas of abandonment or uh even treasure um and from a colonial i guess like imperialist point of view just like hordes of things mm. the hoarding of um you know like those giant like dutch like still lives like they're just these like enormously it's excess yeah. It, yeah, this yeah. kind of gorgeous dripping excess, but like, except this excess is kind of rotten, you know. <laughs> like, uh, and they often show yeah. up in in like a vitrine too. Yeah. So, um, you know, I they love vitrines. Are placed <laughs> on display, you know, and it gives it a sort of museum context as well. So, what is the, you know, obviously your work ends up in museums as well, but um, tell us about that. Well, vitrines really are just very fun to just paint. Just nice, yeah. <laughs> just a glass. No, the but glass. I, yeah, but I, you know, like in the museum kind of context, like I made these sort of fantasy paintings that were, um, like, not the word that is used a lot for the work, which is the quotidian, you know, apartment building stories, but uh, like an allegorical space, which mm. is um, a space of like, a, um, in which. A, basically made up sculptures um, that have a sense of um, um, like... This is one of the pack puddles, by the way. Yeah. I forgot why it has the number seven on it. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so it's, it's a kind of a, a fantasy of how um, there's a linear or uh, a arranged kind of story of like a uh, uh, storytelling of, of of history from you know an imperialist or not imperialist point of view from the winner's side or or the or you know the not winner's side hmm. and um i just wanted it to i guess kind of be like uh, spaces in which you know um negotiations kind of happen across vitrines um you know, the uh, the vitrines become a space where people pay homage to, um, I guess I was trying to imagine like severed kind of defeated kings or whatever, like, <laughs> 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 or it becomes a place of like meditation. Um, and I guess I'm thinking of like the drama of the things like, you know, the three kings or um, 
other kind of um, religious and mythological stories. Mm -hmm. um, the sort of social and political space of the museum, but also social in the sense that there are just people in a room looking at right. this object yeah, and what their relationship is or isn't. There's often this sense of it, like that there are people in your paintings, but they are, as you said, I think, you know, sort of more thinking, feeling internally and not necessarily connecting with one another. Or maybe that connection is sometimes sort of mediated by like a mirror or a screen. And there is a kind of passivity, I, which I like, um, so that, you know, in some of them, it's almost like you have to like decide their fate for them. <laughs> like it's not up to them, <laughs> and kind of that kind of becomes like an, makes an empowered viewer almost, <laughs> or maybe even abusive, you know. Um, and that's kind of exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean the I, the real hallmark for me of your work is it's sort of the richness of this emotional texture there and. The kind of um, you know fantasies almost of the narrative of what's going on that you can produce uh, around they're almost like cinematic moments I feel like you can just sort of they really offer you an ability to sort of create a, a world of imagination around them um, and these figures have this uh, sort of vulnerability to them this passivity um, that is, you know, in its way, sort of very charming and tender and sweet. Thank you. Yeah. Um, they also tend to like fashion these these figures, uh, <laughs> which I, I um, you know, historically, like just looking at a lot of uh, the paintings that I like, uh, European paintings and even like paintings from Mughal India, let's say. Mm. Um, there, there are fashions and, and basically like styles um, of of clothing and, and textures that are very, um, I guess like that are kind of like etched in my brain so that I can kind of tap into uh, a, a kind of flounciness or like different cuts um, um, and thinking about different textures when I, um, think of what someone is wearing. I start to kind of have fun with it. Um, mm. And um, in that regard, I feel like I try not to take the painting too seriously. Like I, it's almost like I'm dressing up dolls. <laughs> like, um, and I feel like that fun eventually leads somewhere uh, more serious in the end. Like, mm. <laughs> but that's a very good driving um kind of force so um like i love uh like creating like different kind of shines and like leather or satin or um there are particular kind of phrase um or batches um different cliches i guess like uh of his art historically of of foreign people of mm. poor people mm of people of color or hairy or, or men or yeah. hairy men let's yes. say or <laughs> like or be, uh, or like and then you know also of of um uh, dignity um mm. and or like how uh, or elitism and um the garage of like that dignity um so i i love playing around with 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 that kind of prince and bobber thing mm. Maybe I can open it up for question. We have some time. Oh, yes, there is one there. I'll have to repeat your question, so forgive me. But ah, it's a question of whether Hawaii might inspire future paintings. I think, um, particularly, there's. I've I've been kind of gravitating towards palm trees and I I have some beautiful ones at you know outside my window um so I think in a very kind of that's the the top of my head I that that I can think of to the you know the thing that might 
a beer in, in my painting. But it's also like a mood, I guess. Um, it's a kind of tropical... Um, I think there's something about a palm tree lit up at night, especially, which is just very... It's in my head and it will keep cooking. We'll see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the nose. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> A question of the nose. Um. I started thinking of like clowns and like Pinocchio um, and um, that, you know, there was something about someone being in a compromised position or angry or sad when they became like a Pinocchio or a clown. I was just like a, uh, it kind of gave it a wooden sense uh, so that like it um, was funny. Um, it was funny that someone, you know, kind of, um, made of like this weak kind of wood is like vulnerable um, in a mean way slightly but also you know has all these feelings um, and um, I, I just found that exciting um, that someone that a marionette is you know kind of feeling in, in a painting um, but it's also I guess like a tool of humor so that like it doesn't kind of sink into too much pity uh, or self-righteousness. Uh, so I I like to use humor that way. Um, it's also kind of self-flagellating. I'm laughing at myself <laughs> for being, and you know, like kind of loving uh, European art and being an immigrant and uh, having left, uh, having started a new life. Um, here, in so many words, I think that's <laughs> that's what the nose is about. <laughs> There's another question here. <laughs> uh, thank, thank. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'll share your Instagram list. Yeah. Completely. Right. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, completely the role of Philip Gustin. Oh, I'm and sorry. You should. You can. Do you want to repeat the question? Um, well, sorry. did I or did I not I steal from Philip <laughs> Guston? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did. <laughs> uh, yeah, I definitely. I mean, I think that it's impossible to be a figurative painter in America and not have to go through the Guston stuff. Um, you know, it's like, it's uh, for me, kind of like, it's like Picasso and then um, Gustin and then like Nicole Eisenman. Um, mm. And it's this kind of R. Crumb kind of territory, which is e extremely American um, in its figuration. Um, the, it, because like, when you think of like Picasso with the big giant people on the beach, that's you can instantly like it's a very European language, but it Gustin is a, the figurative, uh, very definitive kind of figurative to me language of um, um, American figurative paint, painting, and um, he still has a huge mark on all figurative painters. Um, but what you know, what you were saying about the bodies, I think that it's also 
what I love about them, uh, the kind of tubular, like, thinness of them is that they just look so vulnerable. Like, you know, they're also, like, made of rubber. Um, and um, there's something very tender in that. Yes, go ahead. Green. So it's uh it's like Just I think it's an aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> it's an aesthetic choice. I think there's something very uh nocturnal about the color. Uh it looks like I guess like something poisonous, but also night vision. Um it's a very rich and kind of glamorous color. Um but yeah, I guess, you know, as since the 19th century, in our imaginations, we always think of green as something noxious, you know, um, or p poison gas. Um, Arsenic. And, or, or Slytherin or something like yeah. that, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> absinthe. <laughs> yeah, absinthe. <laughs> um, but I think the, the quality of it that most attracts me is that it's very atmospheric. Um, it's... Um, and. And it's the atmosphericness of it is that it just seems like it's a dense kind of um, forest almost um, that is also nocturnal somehow. <laughs> I guess that's those are the kind of um, yeah. feelings that it evokes in me. Um, actually, there was one in the back there. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, it's a question of Mughal influence. Yeah. Um, so in general, I think that um, in the South Asian painting and the small miniature paintings, the perspective was kind of like in storytelling, it's sort of like laid out. Um, um, in a way that it, it kind of like uh, it doesn't it's not the European kind of visual science perspective that goes in um, so the way that I was inspired by that was in some of these the landscapes in this show um, I just wanted to kind of move uh, senselessly or seamlessly in between kind of um, faithful aerial perspectives and just like storytelling <coughs> perspectives, excuse me, um, that would kind of make sense in a, sometimes in a scientific way and sometimes just in an whatever kind of like imaginary way. Uh, particularly, this is the, the landscape with a graveyard, um, which is uh, with a dog, which is in this show. So that's a good example of like when I was, um, in a way that kind of um, Mughal art or Indian miniature perspective sort of informs. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the gestural mark. I yes. um I think it's the <laughs> it's the Keyword. texture and movement of it. Like it's uh it it's it's noisy, it's never at rest. It's also um you know some of the challenges technically of painting that I admire in other artists is um, to create like a goopy mess out of paint but then to control it it's very difficult to do to control it and so when people can do that or make you know make the illusion that they can do that it's very uh, it's very fun to look at for anyone you don't have to be an expert in anything because it's something 
that is very messy and sometimes even toxic that's just being controlled and there's like really um kind of seamless way um but yeah so i would i would say that it's it's the noisy glossy goopy <laughs> thing <laughs> Yes, and then you. Hi. I think that I was lucky that I kind of um, understood that once the um, work leaves my studio, it's out of my control. I'm such a control freak, so um, I I have to I have to let go <laughs> completely mm -hmm. because I and you know I'm very lucky in that a lot of the ways in which it's interpreted is I really couldn't have asked for m more, um, and because some of the stories uh, I guess in the paintings are so personal, um, you know, um, they're they evoke all kinds of responses, you know, from people. Um, but um, that's, I think that that's one thing that I've learned um, is that the only part of it that's in my control is what I enjoy, which is the, you know, the time that I spend alone working um, on the painting. And I think for some of, you know, like, it's it can be very difficult for some people <laughs> to kind of understand that it's not uh it's completely out of your control when it's gone yes go ahead No, that's that's absolutely true. The rule of the eye. So, um, I am I. You know, I trained as an academic painter for like a decade, and I just wanted to kind of make paintings like Van Dyck and Rubens, and just copy their style and and learn and like you know. So that was very freeing because I didn't have to um, strive to be like authentic in my own way at all. But I ended up learning a whole lot, and one of the things, and I, you know, I went to grad school uh, at Pratt, which is a pretty contemporary art, you know, contemporary driven art school, and um, I, you know, for my thesis show, I had been doing these really academic, like, you know, portraits, and one of the my um, teachers who I was very impressed by and my kind of favorite sort of professor there was like, well, um, you know, this is this is a dead art form. <laughs> you can, you just do anything, anything but this. Anything but this. Um, and, you know, I, I couldn't stop, but I felt really kind of bad about that, you know, for years. And, um, and I feel like it's uh, the face and the eyes um, and the uh, kind of the kind of ingredients of a portrait that still actually anchor for me um, uh, my pictures um, it's very tricky for me to like not have a human uh, face or, or, or expressive eyes um, in a composition and like work without the like portrait form entirely and there are only one or two paintings in this show that um, somehow like I was able to <laughs> paint them without uh, people in them. Hmm. Thank you. There's one over here. A graphic novel. Yeah, I uh, have to work on that. <laughs> no. I, yeah, so that, that's one of the reasons that I'm hurrying back tomorrow. I, you know, it's I'm 
uh, making kind of work in the studio by day, then working on the graphic novel <laughs> at night. I've just been going a little bit kind of crazy, but I think that it'll probably be around in like a year. Uh, you know, I started working on that before, you know, in like 2016, and writing is very different. Like every two years, I feel like my own moral compass is so transformed that I have to rewrite everything that I wrote <laughs> before. And like painting doesn't necessarily work that way. So I feel like since 2016, like so many like big things happened in my life that um, every two years, I'm just like, oh, I'm going to have to rewrite everything. <laughs> <laughs> I have such a different perspective on it now. Uh, but in one year. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Please. Yeah, for sure. You can um, repeat the question in your answer, <laughs> which is an excellent um, question. So uh, we're going to talk about the subversiveness of some of the sexiness in the painting. Um, and I, um, you know, like gr having grown up in, in Pakistan, you know, there are places like um, sort of, you know, parks or uh, people, you know, you, you can't be kind of queer or gay out in, in public and the public and the private are two very, very different things. And so in some of the, you know, kind of landscapes in, in this show and in other shows as well, I wanted to kind of maybe like fantasize about the, the 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 excitement and the possibility of like an assignation or a meeting um, or the d the sense of danger uh, that comes with um, I guess it, it, being in a social system that pushes those kinds of um, unions as like um, outside the law or illegal you know. Um, and pushes it maybe into the darkness. Um, and so I wanted to kind of think about the, um, not only the kind of dark part of it, but also the kind of excitement of it. Um, and think of, you know, nature as a kind of um, a, a refuge um, and um, as maybe like a queer organism <laughs> itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, kind of those are the things that I guess I was thinking about in in some of those paintings. Were you just talking about the kind of outdoorsy things or like just uh, the apartment? Right. Yeah, and just like domesticity is like I, I, you know, I feel like queer domesticity, and it's so important to me because I grew up uh, without, I guess, like um, uh, a whole lot of safe spaces. And when I was doing these paintings, uh, initially I didn't really um, articulate it to myself, but I, I was thoroughly enjoying them, and I would just keep making like one kitchen and one bedroom, and like you know, kind of like these sort of very cozy little scenes one right after the other and feel really good and um and i understood later that it was because like i i got that very late you know i didn't always have that um and so you know that um that's sort of one of the um kind of reasons that i was creating those environments that are also like sometimes like you know cute and sexy but uh, to me, I guess, like the kind of overall reason for uh, 
um, for painting them was the idea of domesticity. Thank you so much for that. And I'm afraid we might have to leave it here as we're okay. at just eight, just over eight. But um, I wanted to say thank you once again uh, for being here, for your wonderful work, and for the work that this exhibition is going to do in this place. Well, thank you so much for having me. This thank is you. incredible.